Good morning, John. Congrats. You picked a really amazing month to take off. I am, on the other hand, absolutely going through it. And in public, nonetheless. But why? Like, why, in the aftermath of any major event, like the attempted assassination of Donald Trump, do I get so stuck on the internet? Catherine actually asked me why this happens to me, and I didn't know the answer. The first thing I said was, I, I do not think I can explain to you my relationship with the news. But we kept chatting, and she, she like, wondered if it's that I feel like I need to make content about it, and so I need to know about it, and I think the answer to that is, like, yes, but not the way it sounds. I don't feel like I need to make content about major things that happen in the world, but major things happening in the world makes me think stuff, and then I want to share those thoughts. And sometimes I don't share those thoughts because I like, can't be convinced that they would actually make things any better. So there are lots of thoughts that I don't share, but I am looking for the thoughts that I have that might be helpful, and thinking that thought made me realize why I doom scroll. What I am doing in the moments after significant events is not trying to figure out what content to make about it, what tweets to tweet. I'm trying to figure out what world I live in now. Like the world has clearly changed and that unsettles me and it makes me uncomfortable. I had a vision of how the world existed and what might be coming and when that vision gets disturbed, I want to find information that either lets me settle back into my previous set of explanations for how the world works or it gives me a new understanding of the world. I'm just looking for the, like the comfort of understanding. Now this in itself is a form of bias. It's recency bias. I'm thinking that the attempted assassination is a huge deal that's going to fundamentally change the world because things that happen recently feel more important than things that happened in the past. And of course, the assassination attempt is a very big deal. But also on Sunday, everybody was saying like, Donald Trump is definitely going to win now. I basically texted that to you, John. But now we've seen that the assassination attempt does not seem to have changed the polling numbers much. But also, what I saw as I doom scrolled was legitimately stuff that did help me understand what world we were heading into. Most importantly, like the identity of the murderer. He was white and American and not a recent immigrant. And I am of the opinion that if he had been any other kind of person, despite the fact that it still would have been like one disturbed guy pulling one trigger, the narrative would have been entirely different. Now look, a different set of identities for this guy would not have changed the reality and the tragedy of what happened, but it would have changed the narrative. It would have given us more to yell at each other about. And more reasons for people to be scared of people that they are already overly afraid of. So I feel weird about about saying this, but the fact that he was a white American born and raised did take the temperature down. And that was an important thing to find out. And that's broadly the kind of stuff we're searching for. We want to know not just how bad it is for the people injured or killed, but how bad it's going to be for everyone. How much more is this going to increase the temperature at an already very hot moment in America? And so I will say, though keep watching after I finish this sentence, there is something rational about doom scrolling. It isn't just a self-destructive act. It is a self-protective act as well. But we have to recognize that when we try to understand some new part of our world, we are doing two things. We are taking information and changing our understanding of reality based on that information, but just as much our brains are fighting to fit information into our previous conception of reality. I want to talk about this, but I also desperately do not want to get into the weeds of conspiracy theories here because those people can get a little scary. So let's just take one single thing. Was Thomas Crooks more of a progressive or more of a conservative. If you're progressive, it's gonna be more comfortable and better for your cause if he was more conservative. And if you're more conservative, it's gonna be more comfortable and better for your cause for him to be progressive. And one of the very first things that came out after his identity was his voter registration and political donations. He was a registered Republican and he once gave $15 to a progressive get out the vote organization. He was also wearing a shirt from a gun-focused YouTube channel. Then later we heard that he once told a classmate that that classmate was stupid for supporting Trump. And now, we we have enough information to pick and choose from to build whichever narrative we would like. And also, we can work to discredit the information that we don't like, so we don't have to believe it. Like you might see a conservative saying, no, he only registered as a Republican in order to vote against Trump in the primary, which, I don't know, maybe. But anyone saying that has no idea if it's true or not, and also being like a huge fan of guns isn't generally a liberal thing. And also, there are almost certainly people watching this right now who think that Crooks' donation to a progressive organization was actually some 69-year-old in Pittsburgh, but it was 
Thomas Crooks the Assassin four years ago when he was 17. There was a tweet that went viral that linked the donation with the 69-year-old, but it didn't actually link anything to anyone. It just posted the fact that there was a 69-year-old in Pittsburgh who's named Thomas Crooks, who, by the way, I hope is doing well after what has had to have been a pretty weird week. But the record of the donation listed Crooks's address. It had just been blacked out on the social media screenshot for obvious reasons. So yes, it was him. The point is, there's enough information, supposition, and incorrect information to tell either story, but not so much that these stories became a broader shared narrative. Instead, people saw the things that the folks in their bubbles shared, and instead of a shared narrative, a shared version of reality, people get to form their specially crafted comfortable realities. We aren't just trying to figure out what universe we're living in and to redefine our stories to fit with reality. We inevitably pick and choose the pieces of reality that fit the stories we are comfortable in and already believe. And I know this because there's a third thing here. For me, this means looking at this and saying, that does not seem to be a guy who hated Donald Trump in particular. It's a guy who seems to have hated everything. He Googled where Joe Biden was going to be. He Googled where Donald Trump was going to be. Also Merrick Garland and Christopher Wray and an unnamed member of the British royal family. And that sounds to me like a guy who has been convinced by himself or by external forces that everything is terrible and that it would be a good thing to just hurt the world. But look, I, in that thing I just said, if that sounded really appealing to you, that's us doing literally the same thing. Fitting the facts to my existing conception of the world because I am a little sick of people tearing down absolutely everything at every opportunity, and I'm sick of the nihilism it creates in our society generally, and I am sick of the space that it leaves for strongmen to come in and say, only I can fix this, but only if you give me all the power. Because look, there's a fourth option here, and I'm wondering if you can even identify it. It is the one that's definitely true. Not that he was progressive, not that he was conservative, not that he was lonely and despondent and just wanted to be violent. Can you guess what it was? It's that we don't know. It's definitely the truth and also the hardest thing to live inside of. We don't know sucks. Not knowing is so powerful, but also uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable that I, ju I just don't see people doing it much, if at all. Not in public, not loudly, not on social media. And that's why we scroll, because we hate not knowing. Twitter and its many voices are there to give us what we want. The illusion that our stories are true and that the future is knowable. But we don't get to have that. If you want to have an allegiance to truth, you have to trade in the comfort of constant certainty. John, I'll see you in August.